Now this is the Panasonic BGH-1. If you are watching this, chances are you already know a bit about the camera and its specs, so this isn't what the video is about. What I aim to cover in this piece are the ins and outs of the settings and menu system for the camera. I'll also cover my preferred settings for shooting certain scenes and how you can customize the camera to meet your needs when filming. For those of you who don't know much about the BGH-1, I personally see this as being the baby brother to the EVA-1 and also fills the gap between that and the Panasonic GH5s. Its form factor, codecs and battery life make it a great camera for gimbal work too, plus it has multiple connection types for studio type work too, and it really is quite a versatile little camera. So onto the setup and menu system. First up, what we'll look at are the setup of the camera through the menu. We won't go down the menu in order, instead we'll look at the key bits that you need to set up when first setting the camera up all the way through to specific settings for different scenes right before you start filming. This piece will also follow how I would personally set this camera up. Now it doesn't make it the right way for everyone, so follow this video as much as you feel suits your needs as a filmmaker and adapt what you need to to make sure that the camera works for you. When you first unbox the BGH-1, you'll see there are several mounting points around the front end of the camera. As the camera doesn't come with a monitor of any kind, these make for great points for you to mount your monitor or other accessories to, though I would recommend a cage system rather than mounting everything directly to the camera body. Around the rest of the camera, you'll have multiple connection points for the visual outs, such as SDI and HDMI ports. There's also mic and headphone ports. There's a network and power port, USB ports, as well as slots for your battery. And on the left-hand side of the camera is a door hiding two SD card slots. As for the rest of the camera, there are several customizable buttons dotted around it, and there's a hot shoe on top as well. Now that's pretty much it for an overview of the physicals of the camera, so we'll take a look at the menu system. So with a battery charged up and in place, and with the monitor powered up and plugged in, we're set to go through the menu and setting up the camera. Now as with any camera, if this is the first time that you're setting up your BGH-1, you want to make sure that the time, date, and time zone, and other key general info is correct. Now you should be prompted with this if it's not already set up. If you're not prompted and you need to set it up, then all you need to do is go to the wrench symbol down at the bottom on the submenu and select the camera's initial settings. First up is clock set and time zone. These are important to be accurately set up as you'll need these in post-production. They'll also really help you out when filming with more than one camera. Below that is system frequency. This needs to be set to 50 Hertz or PAL as we're in the UK, so it shouldn't conflict with any other electrical devices. You can change the name of the device, which is helpful if you have multiple, or you want to keep tabs on which device is yours. And the final one to look at in this sub-menu is the firmware to make sure that your camera is up to date with the latest version, as Panasonic are really good with implementing new features with new updates. So moving to the top sub-menu of the wrench menu, you'll find the details regarding card usage and file naming. Here you can format your cards, pick how the double card slot functions, the folder file settings, info on resetting, and what file number and what copyright info is stored on each file. With the dual slot function, your options are relay recording, so recording onto one card, then filling up and moving to the next. This option is hot swappable, so if you're recording long interview pieces, once your first card is full, it will automatically switch to the next card, allowing you to replace card one. Backup Rec is recording all media to both cards at the same time, creating redundancy for your media. This is better for docu-style or docu-stuff, and shoots where you're not recording very long interviews and it creates an instant backup of everything you're shooting. And the final option is Allocation Recording, where you can pick video to go to one card and stills to go to the other. Heading down to the next submenu, you'll have Level Gauge Adjust, which isn't necessarily something you'll need to look at unless you're having issues with the camera's inbuilt level gauge. Below that are the settings for in and outs of the camera. Headphone volume is straightforward. Do test this when taking an audio feed from something like a lab or a top mic and adjust accordingly. This is just your headphone volume and not the volume that you're recording your audio at. LAN or Wi-Fi allows you to set up the camera with a network or a companion app allowing control over the imagery captured by the camera. Bluetooth is similar. You have control over the camera settings and with the compatible app and phone will help you location logging too. HDMI and SDI connection options allow you to pick what is being delivered through these connections. So if you're using an external monitor that records like this video assist, then you might not want to send the view assist setting 
to the recorder, allowing you to capture the camera's V-Log output. You can also choose what goes out to what monitor. So you could use a cheaper monitor, as the one for focusing, camera settings and display, and other info, while sending a clean feed via SDI to a recorder. The final settings on the sub-menu are about the indicators for when you're using the network feature, or for when the cards are being used. The final one in this is the little cog, and this allows you to save and load custom settings and modes within the camera, allowing you to quickly recall specific settings within the camera itself. These modes are accessible through the top menu, which is the camera with the little word mode beneath it. We'll move to the menu just below that one, which is the camera on its own. There are quite a few sub-menu segments here, and we'll cover off most of those. The top two in the main segment of the menu are for image quality settings. First up is the exposure mode, giving you the choice of manual, shutter priority, aperture priority, or program. Below are the settings for exposure and looks. These include exposure compensation, which comes into play with more automatic settings. Sensitivity or ISO, white balance, and photo style. Photo style allows you to pick the scene's colors and data that's collected. This also dictates how much work needs to be done during the edit. You'll find a majority of filmmakers will opt for V-Log, as this gives the greatest amount of captured data, but is the flattest profile and therefore needs the most grading. For quick turnarounds, profiles such as Like 709 or CineLike will give you something that is pretty much ready to go with very little grading. Below that on the menu is Metering Mode. These give you different options for how the scene is metered, or how the scene's bright and dark areas are read by the camera, to tell you how well the scene is exposed. As well as individual ISO settings, you have the option for selecting the camera's dual native ISO setting for auto, low or high. And finally on that sub-menu are options for your auto ISO setting. You can set a maximum and a minimum ISO when using auto ISO. Though I would recommend manually setting your ISO when shooting video and only adjusting it as the scene's lighting levels change as a whole. The next image quality menu segment follows on with the camera settings from the first page. The main one you want to look at here is the SS stroke gain operation. You'll find a lot of cameras in the middle of the top tier, such as the EVA1 or the Vericam will operate with the shutter angle and ISO. So this tends to be what I opt for in camera. Moving down to the next segment or the image format one, you're able to pick what codecs you want to shoot in. This will be MP4 or MOV and each will open up a different quality settings for recording formats. So here, check what media you're using and making sure you're making the best decision based on that and the output you'll be producing and what frame rate you'll need for your production. Each of these options does have a little rundown of what it is they do and what options are available within that selected recording quality. Depending on the recording quality, you'll be able to select variable frame rate. This option allows you to shoot up to 200 frames a second in PAL. It will go higher, but you need to think about the frame rate of your deliverable project and keeping it in a multiple of that. So as I'm outputting 25 frames per second, 200 gives me the correct slow motion rate. Below that is the timecode. You can select how your timecode behaves and how it's output to other devices. And on the next page, you have one option for recording raw out via HDMI, but this does disable internal recording though. As we're looking at this camera for its video capabilities, we'll brush lightly over this segment as you really should be focusing manually when shooting video. But just to cover it off, you'll have different options for autofocusing, which may be useful in certain situations. You can also set up focus peaking here too. This will help you to see what you're focused on when you're doing it manually. You can adjust the color and sensitivity of it. My preferred setting is red and plus one, as it gives you a good visual to monitor on screen. Audio for this device is important, and there are several of these areas that you'll really want to focus on. Firstly, if you're capturing audio, make sure your sound levels are displayed on screen. You'll need to visually monitor this as well as listen to the live audio, the audio coming through the camera. Once those bars are on and your mic is plugged in, check that the levels are coming through correctly and not too loud or too quiet and adjust accordingly. I'd usually have the level limiter off as I should be monitoring the levels myself, making sure that the audio doesn't peak. I also turn off the wind noise canceller as this can interfere with the captured audio. For the mic socket setting, you have the options of what type of input you have coming into the camera's 3.5mm input. These are line level, passive input, or active input, where power is provided to the mic. Make sure you check this before plugging the mic in, as mics can be damaged by providing them with power when they don't need it to be. 
The final submenu we'll cover off on this segment will be the Others page. The key focus here is the image stabilizer. A lot of MFT lenses do come with stabilization, and this does really help when shooting handheld. But if you're using a lens without this, then do consider the E or electronic version, as it actually works quite well. Other than that, the rest of the options in the submenu aren't really things that I would make any use of as a filmmaker. Now heading to the cog icon on the menu, we'll take a look at everything within this menu that you'll need to look at before heading out and shooting. Firstly, in the image quality segment, you can select which of the photo style settings are shown in the quick menu. You can also set up and manage custom styles too. Below that is the option for the increments in which your ISO changes. If you're filming with this camera, then try to stick with the dual native ISOs of 400 and 2000 when you're shooting in vlog. This will help keep the noise to a minimum. If you need a little more from your camera in terms of captured light, then you can always extend your ISO using this menu option. If not exposed correctly, then this will introduce a lot of noise into your images. So just be careful with that. Generally, the options for the final bit can be left as is. If you learn the correct exposure look for the camera and use the scopes on your external monitor, then you should be fine in evaluating the scene yourself. In the focus and shutter submenu, you have the options for autofocus and auto exposure locks. But if you're shooting video, you should really be doing a lot of the exposure evaluation and controls yourself and keeping off any of the auto settings. And the rest of the settings here can be passed by, as with having focus peaking enabled, you shouldn't need any additional assistance. The operation submenu will give you the option for changing the layout and function of the quick menu. You can also customize all of the custom function buttons dotted over the camera. When doing this, there's no right or wrong function to assign to a button, but really do think about what common settings changes you'll make and which of these need to be made quickly or on the fly. Once you've thought about these, then change them to the custom buttons and make sure you're putting them in the most logical places. Things like shutter speed aren't really something I would put in a custom function button, or at least I wouldn't put it as a priority. I'd almost always shoot in 180 degree shutter. If I needed to shoot in something else, then I'd want to figure out carefully what that shutter angle needed to be. Similarly, if I was shooting solely on Cine or Cine style lenses, where the aperture control is on the lens, then I wouldn't assign aperture or iris control to a custom button. But things like LUT assist, variable frame rates, and other display options would be something I'd regularly visit and want to do quite quickly. Other options like ISO, white balance, etc. can be left on the Q menu. And this can be customized and means you can quickly get to this to change settings when you need to. Moving down to monitor and display, you have two pages on this menu, so we can work our way through them. This section does go through types of data and info that will be displayed on your external monitor. You can pick which of the options you have turned on based on what types of info are important to you as the camera operator. If you're familiar with any of these items and you know which you prefer to have displayed, then you can go ahead and switch the display on options for your shooting style. If you're new to filmmaking, then these are worth spending some time understanding what each option does. For me, things like histogram, framing, view assist, zebras, center markers, and even focus peaking would be turned off in camera as my external monitor does all of these features, which would mean I can have them enabled at all times, even whilst recording to my external monitor without that information being recorded to it. But again, that all depends on how and what you're recording. So this setup can be very personal to the user. The next menu option is the in and out for the camera. You have the options here to pick what is sent to the camera's outputs, so either HDMI or SDI. You also have the option to choose how and when the cooling fan comes on, and if the camera gets hot, then it'll come on and may create a little noise, which can be an issue when capturing audio. But then again, so can an overheating camera. So it's best to weigh up your options and pick which is best for what you're shooting. I can say in the times I've used the camera, I've not noticed the van kick in at all. The option for the tally lamp is useful if you're being discreet whilst filming, or you don't want your camera to be a distraction to the person that you're interviewing. So then just switch this off. Otherwise it does give a good indication when you're recording. The very final menu is for lens control. I keep these options switched to off as normally I'd be using the manual cine lenses when shooting video content. So there you have it. I hope you found this system walkthrough for the BGH-1 useful. Now, if you do have any further questions about the camera or any other Panasonic product, then do drop a message in the comment section and the team at WEX will get back to you. Thanks for watching.